my dad asked me first to sh- share just a little bit about maybe the last three years. I've been not in Oklahoma for the last three years, um, and, and kind of what I've been doing, and this is going to be interesting watching myself on the screen back here. Um, it, what I've been doing for the last three years, and kind of what God, maybe what God's been, I added this to it, what God's been doing in me. Um, but for the last three years, I've been in uh, Texas, working in the South Lake, Texas area. I don't know if you know where that is, near Grapevine Airport, not far from there. Uh, working for the King's University, which is uh, a school that's primarily a ministry school. We only offer um, degrees in ministry fields at the undergraduate, graduate level, and then there's also uh, now, a, it's not newer necessarily, but a seminary. So for those of you who are familiar with Jack Hayford and Jack Hayford's ministry, it was founded by him um, in 1997 in California and moved to um, the, the South Lake area and is under the Uh, ministries of Gateway Church. So if you're familiar with Robert Morris and Gateway Church, um, it's kind of an auxiliary ministry of Gateway Church. So I've been there. Um, What I loved about going there and the reason I went there um, really was um, it it was an opportunity to allow allow me to use uh, some of the, the gifts that God had given me to further the kingdom of God. More practically, day to day, 40 hours a week, I got to dedicate towards um, we're getting people in this university to equip them to be ministers of the gospel. And that's something that we, we profess within the university and, and within our team. And so that's kind of what I've been doing and um, was blessed to continue to do that and move back to Oklahoma. And so I'm still doing that. Um, I'm just getting to do it uh, from here remotely. So uh, thanks to this little uh, device right here. Um, it allows me to, to continue to do that. And so, but over, going back further than that, really God began to do um, a work in me, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know how many years ago now, prior to that, that uh, just to really, I guess, a hunger to see God's word proclaimed. Um, I have a, uh, my driver is accuracy. I, I strongly desire for people to, to hear the word uh, for what the word says, to hear it accurately, be interpreted accurately, to 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 the best that we can. Um, I will never understand scripture to its fullest um, and, and in its fullness, but um, to the best of our ability. So, I just you know, my number one passion is to see each and every individual um, become come to the fullness that God intended for each of us to live as, rather than than constantly struggle and constantly try to get through life um, worried about this and that, really see who God has created us to be and through his word and through his spirit become that person. So there's a little bit about that. Um, First, as I probably will always do, this may get annoying, I'll mention for those who are live streaming on Facebook, my prayer is that this is just a um, uh, just supplemental to the church that you belong to. Um, and that it's important to belong to a local community of believers. Um, it's what God intended, and it's what brings about the fullness of what God desires for, the, for Christian living. So if you're sick, you're on vacation, whatever, this is a great tool. Um, or if maybe you're kind of in that in-between season looking for something, you're welcome to Life Community Church, but plug in somewhere. So that's my little bit that you'll probably always hear me do um, because I believe it's important. I'm hearing thumbs up for more volume, or else I'm doing a really, really great job. Um, one way or the other, I'm getting thumbs up. Probably a volume thing. Um, so this morning, I, I really I wrestled with the, the title of what this message um, would be, and I, I still don't, I, even this morning as of five minutes ago, thinking it through my head, I don't know what it's called. But what we're really looking at today is um, really the sufficiency of God in the life of a believer, and what contentment can be found in that or should be found in that. And so um, my hope and my prayer is that um, through the next two hours, um, <laughs> I just, I, I kid, um, for the next little while that, um, that we accomplish that and that there's a seed planted and that we are stirred up um, to go out and to, to live and to be challenged um, in a new way. So before we begin, let's pray. Father God, we love you, and we are thankful for this opportunity that we have together together and to uh, 
uh, hear your word proclaimed. I pray this morning that our love for you increases through the word. And I pray that there's a hunger stirred in each and every one of us. That's the objective. That's the goal, God. And through hearing your word this morning, through me proclaiming your word, is that our affections grow for you and that our hunger to know and love you more uh, increases, Father. And I pray this morning that the illnesses that we are struggling with, we are suffering with, Father, that you would bring about healing. You would also bring about uh, um, uh, peace and comfort, knowing that despite the circumstances, despite the storm that we're facing right now, God, you are there in the midst of the storm. And for that, we are eternally grateful. In your name we pray. Amen. So, uh, it's kind of interesting that I talk about, so I, for the King's University, I work in uh, marketing and communications. And so, um, it, that's, that's what I do there. And so, some of what I'm going to be talking about this morning kind of ties into uh, some of the knowledge that I've gleaned in that, um, in that space over the last, you know, five years um, that we'll come to in a little bit. But let's start off, um, I'm going to start in Genesis 3. Verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. Verse 4, you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from, eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So uh, to set this up, the, you know, this is right after um, God had created the plants, the animals. Here are man and woman. Really, they're without sin, and they have uh, all that they could ask for. Anything that, that they desired, anything that they uh, had need of was right there in their presence. And sin had not yet entered at this point in time. We didn't have sin in mankind. This is kind of the story of the fall of man. Um, and if you uh, think this morning that you would have been like, I just would have said no to that serpent, and I would have not taken of that fruit. You and I are Adam and Eve. We would have taken of the fruit, um, just to clear that up. So they're lacking nothing, fully sufficient in, in what Christ had provided for them. But here we have um, an example in that of, of really how Satan um, operates. And so I'm going to go back to uh, verse 1. We see that Satan, the deceiver, in the form of a serpent, poses this question. Did God really say... Uh, you must not eat from any tree in the garden. And w where I want to go with this particular point is here we have Eve, <clears throat> and she has all that she needs. And here comes Satan. Here comes the deceiver, the liar, to say, did he really say that? Did God really say that? And so really how I want to pose that question in <clears throat> us to look at in our own lives is how often is the deceiver planting seeds of doubt or uncertainty or question in our mind? And some of those questions I, I've laid out here, how often do you hear, uh, does God really love me? Will God provide for my needs? How often do you hear <clears throat> these moments or these questions coming up in our heads? Uh, for, for those who are single in the room, will God bring that man or that woman along? Will that ever happen? Uh, he, this one's a little more touchy. You know, in, in the situation being married, did I marry the right person? 
when Satan plants that seed of doubt, did I marry the right, is this, is this the right spouse? Is this who God intended? Am I still in love with this person? Satan plants this seed of doubt. Um, if, it's, if it's the promises of God, if it's something God's uh, spoken to you at some point in time, did God actually say that? Is that actually what he meant by what he said? Even taking it a step further in, in times like, uh, especially when we, we get to reading Scripture on our own, is, does God really mean that? Is that really what Scripture says? Did he really mean to live it in that way? Um, so these questions, are, another one we, we probably face here is, is this the right church for you? Are you happy with this church? Is this, the, is this where God intended for you to be? So we have these questions that begin to plant a seed of doubt. We see it with Eve. What does he ask? Did God really say that you must not eat from any tree in the garden? At that point, Eve hadn't sinned yet. But here was this seed of doubt that was being planted in her mind. Following this, we see, so, so we, we begin here with what would be considered Satan's questions. He starts to question the, the things in our lives, or he starts to question the truth of God in our lives. And next, he follows up with what I would categorize as, as a story, as Satan's story that he's going to tell us. And that is uh, beginning in verse 4, continuing into verse 5. You will certainly, you will not certainly die. For God knows, I, I skipped the part in between there. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So here begins this story. Uh, oh, God, God's trying to withhold something from me. There's more to be had than what God has uh, allowed me to have. Um, so here we begin these stories, hearing these stories, and, and I've laid some of these out to kind of fit yourself into this and see how these stories are, are happening. And I don't just say in your life, in my life, I get questions of doubt. I get, my, the, my entire journey from the moment I got up this morning, uh, well, preparing this sermon, this message all week long, even to the point of coming up here, questions of doubt. Questions of doubt. Is, this really, is that really what that scripture says? Is that really what God's word said? Are you really supposed to be doing this? Are you really qualified to be doing this? Doubt, 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 doubt. These, these seeds of doubt uh, being planted inside me. So, What's the story that he's telling you? Um, and, well, I'll get to that point in a minute. So some of the, some of the storylines that he might tell you is, you, like, you should have gotten that promotion. So he's, is this, like, you, you know what? I should have gotten that, that promotion. Or you're too busy to help others. You don't have enough to be generous. Your house isn't as nice or as big as their house. Your car isn't as nice as their Your marriage doesn't look quite like their marriage. So is your marriage, is, it, is something wrong with your marriage? And so here we have, we have more doubt. These stories that Satan begins to tell us in our lives that begin to plant seeds of doubt or question. Um, and we're in an age, um, unlike when Adam and Eve were on Facebook and Instagram, because they weren't. We're in an age where we are faced with um, this constant reminder. Is, is anyone in here on Facebook or Instagram? Anyone? Everyone? Everyone? Is there anyone that's not? That's the proper question. Anyone that's not? We've got a few people who are not. So if you're not, I'm going to enlighten you <laughs> as to the world that is um, social media. And this is my space. So this is what I do for a living, um, kind of, um, is... Uh, I see these trends, I watch these trends, and I do a lot of research because I'm a nerd, and nerds do a lot of research. Um, and so really what we see is the, uh, there's a lot of psychological battle that goes on with social media because we are only being exposed to the highlight reel of people's lives, the demo reel 
of like, hey, it's, it's, you know, I'm there. I have to fight it. You know, I have to fight this battle of, of really saying I'm going to be intentional about not going there and not doing this because I'm, that you have people who, and, and people, maybe, they, maybe some people do have ill intent, and, and this is the pride of life for them, and this is the way they showcase their life, and, and maybe there's some sinful nature in that. But I believe for the most part, people don't have bad intention, but it's the highlight reel. And so here's, they're showing, hey, look at this, my new house. Here's my new car. Here's the vacation. Another, and here I'm thinking, another vacation? Like, I haven't had one in a lot. You know, it, it, didn't you just go on a vacation? And so here's this life that's being presented to me that's, that's not my life. So what is it doing? It's making me question, what, what, why don't I have what, what that person has? Why don't, you don't see this moment of destruction or, or, or uh, the, the, you know, a good example would be my family where I've got, sometimes, somehow, I can get all three kids crying at one time. Um, it's a skill. <laughs> Not everybody can do that. But I can get them all crying at the same time. And that's not that moment that I grab the kids and we take a selfie um, and post that on social media. Like, I don't, that's not the moment that I share, but that's the reality of life. And, and if, I'm, if I'm honest, like, that's the majority of life is the struggle and is the fight. But our, what we're being exposed to within social media um, is just the highlight reel. It's just the great things that are happening in people's lives. But what we don't realize is what that's doing inside of us. And it's planting these seeds of question and doubt and dissatisfaction with our life. And we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. But beyond that, we're, it's, it, there's a, even a step further. Did I get louder? No? Okay, sorry. Um, there's a step further where where now, so these companies, you know, they started, and this isn't like, man, this, don't get me wrong, this is not like a, hey, these companies are the worst in the world. Maybe they are, but it started as like, hey, share your moments, share your life, and, and then entered in greed. And now we have this opportunity to take advantage of people's moments and people's vulnerabilities in their life. And so, through algorithms, through offerings to uh, advertising, I, I have access, I have the ability to show you whatever material really I want. There's, a, there's some guidelines. I can put it in front of you on your feed, and what they'll do, it's displayed to you at the moments they know that you'll most engage with it. So the moments that maybe you may be most vulnerable or most open to um, making a purchase or making a decision now that information is being shown to you because they know based on your behavior of the sites you're coming from, the sites you're going to, and your interaction within the platform, they know who you are. They have this profile, this persona around you. And so to take it a step further, you're being shown things purposefully, and so we're being shaped even a little bit more and a little bit further. That's that may be a whole other talk that's not for a Sunday morning at some point in time, but um, it's something that's happening in us. And so if anything, and this isn't part of this, I would say um, be aware and set some safeguards up for yourself. I'm not saying it's, in, it's inherently bad and we should just abandon it altogether. You won't, you won't miss a thing if you do that. It would be okay to do that, but create some safeguards on how you interact and, and realize that there are things that are being shaped inside of you. It is, in, you know, in our lives, I talked about last two times I spoke, really focus on, on discipleship. We're being discipled by all different things in our lives, whatever we're exposing ourselves to. So whatever the majority of what you're exposing yourself to is how you're being discipled. Um, so that that's just a, those are like, two cents for something else. But to know that we're seeing this highlight reel, we're seeing through social media, we're seeing all of these things, and it's, it's making more storylines, more questions. Why don't I have that? Why am I not 
that far along. Look, look how much further along we started. We both started here. Look how much further along they are. Look how much more, how much more money they have than, than me. They seem so much happier than my family. So there's this constant battle um, inside of us. So what, what, what we see here in, in this account in Genesis is that Satan begins by opposing what God said, and then he's offering what God seems to be withholding. He doesn't want you to have what he has. Um, and so it's making us discontent. These questions and stories that I've categorized them to here, you know, they have the allure of success, they create fear um, and comparison, which leads to jealousy and then leads to envy. Um, and something interesting about uh, jealousy, this is a, these are two more cents that I'm going to throw in, four cents this morning that I've uh, given you all. Um, but two cents about jealousy, if we'll notice, you know, there's things in our lives that uh, we tend to get more jealous about or, or not jealous about at all. Um, I, let, me, let me give an example. Um, when I hear someone who's a, an excellent uh, singer, um, like, I enjoy it, I'm thankful for it, but um, I don't necessarily get jealous that, like, I'm not that good of a singer. Like, why can't I sing like Sherry? Obviously, that'd be weird, because for me to sing like her would already just be awkward. <laughs> but, like, why can't I sing that well? You know, I don't, I don't struggle with that. But maybe it's in a different space where, uh, l- let's say it's... Uh, Let's say for me, for years, it was, it was in business, and it was somebody excelling or doing well. Um, it was like, why, why can't I? But, well, they're not, you know, they're doing this wrong. They're not doing this the right way. They could have done this better. Well, why, why am I not? And so we, it begins with this comparison, which leads me then to jealousy. But what they expose, this one really, you should take this one home. Really what they expose are the idols of our hearts, the things that are inside of us that we cling to that are the idols of our hearts are those things we get that passionate about that we begin to see that comparison, we begin to see that jealousy that then gives birth to envy, we begin to see it raise its ugly head because there are things we get jealous about and there are things we don't. And so what that reveals are the idols of our heart. Does that, does that make sense? Does it, does it, maybe that's hard to hear. People are kind of like, uh, oh, you're kind of scaring me. Um, but I, I, when, I, when, when that was kind of revealed to me, it was like, yes, it resonated with my heart. Yes, there are things that I don't, that I don't get jealous about. But man, there are other things that, that do drive me to that. So those are two cents just to, to be aware of um, what's happening in our lives. So we're going to go to Galatians 5.16 for, for just a minute. Because these things here, uh, I, I may reference, let's... So these, these stories, these uh, questions that are being posed here, they are, they are the seeds really being planted that have an appeal to our fleshly desires. Does that make sense? So they're a temptation to act on the fleshly desires that are within us. So I'm going to start here in Galatians. So what are these desires of the flesh? Galatians 5, starting verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Well, they just spoiled the whole rest of the verse right there. There's the answer, but we're going to continue on here. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are at odds. They are, uh, they are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit... You are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. 
sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. I'm going to stop there for just a moment. One of the things uh, that we are facing in this century um, is a time in the church's history when the church is no longer seen. Some of these things, you know, the Scripture says that the, the acts of the flesh are obvious, and to a believer they are, but to some of the church that's maybe gotten a little more secularized or, or liberal in their, their leanings, some of these things aren't as obvious anymore. And we actually uh, are reaching a point um, in the Bible Belt, we've kind of, we've kind of always just a little bit insulated um, through the, the access of information and globalization. We have exposure to a little more than we've ever had in, in history, but we are now in a time when um, we're starting to see that the church is no longer the moral standard for our culture and our society. We're actually the, being seen as immoral because our beliefs oppose what would be the freedoms that we think we should have as a culture. And so we are still the moral standard, but because of the secularization of society, and what is now seen as should be acceptable and should not be acceptable, we are now the being ostracized. It's slowly but surely happening. We're, there's some maybe post-Christian parts of the world that are, that are experiencing this, definitely more than we are. Um, but it's, it's inevitable that, that it comes to this area. That's kind of the way things work. The East Coast, West Coast, it all kind of eventually works its way to this part of the world. So, these are the, uh, uh, the desires of the flesh that we laid out here, that these temptations drive, the temptations of the enemy do drive us to act on. So, it says in verse 22, it goes on to say, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, which is patience, um, also interpreted as tolerance, which is interesting, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Something that really stood out to me here in verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus Christ Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. And so we talk about these fleshly desires, it seemingly, it seems that we should be free from them. We have crucified them with Christ. So why do I talk about us still battling with them, or why do we still battle with them? And I think something that I've been experiencing for years, so I'm a church rat, I've been in church my whole life, and in I've seen this a lot in church where it, where it seems like, hey, I, can't, I can no longer have these desires. I can no longer struggle with these issues. I'm a believer. I go to church. I have to have my act cleaned up. Uh, the reality is that is, that's not the truth, that none of us have it, have it cleaned up. But what's, what's interesting to me, and I feel like the Lord really revealed this to me as I was, as I was really thinking about this, it's like, you know, we, we, we have these desires of the flesh, and it says those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, with its passions and its desires. But Scripture also says that we must, if we want to be a follower of Christ each and every day, we have to pick up our cross and we have to follow after him. We're having to crucify our fleshly desires each and every day. So we crucify them today, yes. But guess what? We've got to wake up tomorrow and we've got to crucify those fleshly desires that are within us. So when we keep encountering, we keep coming back, and we keep facing that desire, that fleshly desire again, and that temptation again. Uh, there, hopefully, there's a there's a strength that builds up against that. But know that it's requiring a death 
to ourself and our desire that we, the nature that we were born into, a death to that each and every day. Because it's, otherwise you read this and it's like, I should be, that should be gone. That should be out of my life. But understand, Jesus says, if you want to be a follower of mine, you're going to take up your cross every day. That means crucifying to self each and every day, which is death to self for, for a better explanation. So something that's important here to, to follow this up with is, um, so I, I, maybe I should answer that question. It, it, it answers itself within the scripture. How do I um, not gratify the desires of the flesh? I walk by the Spirit. We look in, in verse 16 where it started and really put the whole rest of the passage on spoiler alert here when it says, I walk by the Spirit and I will not gratify the desires of the flesh. How do I walk by the Spirit? Here we get back into, as it says in John 15, abiding in Christ, becoming one with Christ, abiding in Him and He in us in order to walk in the Spirit. So one interesting thing here is, um, and at first, at first hearing it, it might, uh, it, you might say you're wrong, and it, we can talk about it later if you think I'm wrong, but Satan doesn't have the power, the physical power, to actually make you sin. You notice in, in the account of, of the fall in, with, with Eve, he didn't bite her on the heel. He didn't kill her. He didn't hold her down and force the apple in her mouth. So Satan in our lives is not forcing us to act upon the desires of our nature, of our flesh. He is asking us questions. Did God really say that? Do you really have enough money? Do you really have a big enough house? Do you really have fill in the blank? Or he's telling us stories. We're hearing these storylines that are creating question, they're creating fear in our lives. And that is the temptation, that's the seed that's being planted in us that then we are faced with acting on that or not acting on that. So I'll, I'll go on and, and to, to kind of show this here in James, uh, James 1, verse 13. Yeah, I got louder if I adjust the mic. James 1, chapter 1, verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. There's a good point to make right there. God is not tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil and by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. So the seed, the, the temptation is planted, and it's within us, and we have that opportunity to withstand it or succumb to it. So what's interesting here about Satan is when he is telling you these things and he is asking these questions is, this actually came, this, I prepared for this earlier this week, this morning, and as I was showering, I was I was thinking about this message, and I wanted to hurry up and get out to type something else up because um, something interesting to note about Satan is, is he's, he's a liar and he's a deceiver. And so whatever he's questioning and whatever he's telling, you can know the opposite is true. You can know that uh, that's not what God said, what you're saying. Or if he's questioning, did God really say it? Yes, God really did say that. In Eve's case, she knew the answer. She answered prior. Let me go up here. She answered prior to him responding with his story. So she, he poses the question, and he said, did God, Satan says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? She had the answer. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. So she knew what was truth. She chose not to act on it. 
something that's interesting that's kind of laid out here in Genesis 3. Um, we see, actually, it's funny, you read this scripture, uh, Dad, Pastor Mickey, whatever I call you up here, um, in uh, 1 John 15 that you were sharing on Wednesday night. Um, we see these three things um, play out. So, or not, not it's 1 John 2, um, 15 through 17. I do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Here is Satan in Genesis 3, verse 5, saying, For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God. So there's the the last part of that, the pride of life. The woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, all being revealed here in Genesis 3. So, I've done a, a decent job at, at revealing a problem, <laughs> but I'm that person that I, don't ever bring me a problem without posing some solutions, potentially. So, I, I hope to, to help a little bit with, um, with this problem. Um, so, through all of this, through the, through the questions that are being asked, through the doubts that are being placed in our mind, is all a question of the sufficiency of what God has provided us with as believers. It calls into question what God has given me, what he has provided me with. So at the end of the day, um, when we are discontent, as believers in Christ, places a lack of trust in God. We don't trust that what he's provided for us is enough, that we're, in, we're lacking. We're in need of more. There's something that's missing from my life. These are those things that are being exposed to us that Satan is trying to tempt us with. You're, you, you don't have enough. There is something he's withholding from you. He doesn't want you to have that tree because you're going to know good and evil as he does. You're going to be as wise as God. He's withholding something from you. So discontentment in Christ is ultimately a lack of trust that he hasn't provided you with all that you need to be sufficient. What's interesting about that is when we're in that place and we're discontent, is we get in a, a posturing of taking. We begin to pursue things that God didn't intend for our lives. We have multiple instances in Scripture where we see people um, acting on promises of God prior to their fulfillment. God is extremely patient, more patient than anyone could ever fathom, um, and, and we None of us even come close to the amount of patience he has. And so for things to come to pass, whatever his word is, whatever his promises are, it's always our expectation, that, or it should be our expe- the expectation of us for us to wait on the Lord. But there are times we get impatient and we begin to be discontent. And along those, those, those moments is when, is when the enemy is, is creating those questions. He's asking those questions. Did God really, it's not, that's not, it's not really going to happen. This isn't really what he had for you. Um, we see that a lot in, um, we see that a lot in, in marriage, um, where God, where, where the enemy's asking those questions of you. Is this really the right thing for you? Is this really where, you know, are you really in love with this person? Did, maybe the love, maybe it's just worn off. Is that the story that, that you're hearing? Um, so these are those, those questions and those things that, 
that we're having to wrestle with. Because ultimately, I think a great um, line to capture here is that discontentment says, um, I need rather than I receive. And so getting ourselves to a place that we can say, God, I receive all that you've given me. Not I take. Not I take, not I need, but I receive. Sometimes that might be receiving something that the world doesn't perceive to be good. The goodness of God is hard to to fathom because our interpretation of good and goodness is uh, really um, influenced, heavily influenced um, by a secularized culture. What's good for you and, 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 and in our nature, what's good for us and in, in our interpretation of things is like, well, yeah, of course, more money. Of course, this. Of course, more and more and more and more and more. It's never, you know what? If God would really allow me to be isolated at this moment and all alone, and I could only rely on him, yeah, that would be the best thing for my life. If he would just remove all my friends, take everybody away from me, out of my life. But that doesn't sound like the goodness of God, does it? But the, the fullness that comes from only being able to be relying on God, the growth and the maturity and the development that happens when I'm able to say, I am one with Christ right now, and he supplies all of my needs. I don't need anyone else. I don't need anything else. I am one with the Spirit. So the goodness of God drew us near to him through, through that, whatever that was, through that removal of whatever it was, through that that, that uh, difficulty or that trial that he allowed us to, to go in for our fullness and for our development. Why? And I, I pose this all of the time because living out a life of, of a disciple of Christ and as a follower of Jesus does not make sense if we do not understand the stakes. And so I talk about the stakes a lot. And so if we believe there is one true God and if he is preparing an eternal home for us and we are to share in glory with him one day is the only way the call to Christianity makes any sense because it's a death to everything. It's an, it's an opposition to everything you're being told and being tr- that your, your, your nature desires. And so that's why I say the goodness of God can look like many different things. It can look like promotions. It can look like uh, 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 what we would categorize as worldly blessings. But it can also look at, you know what, the goodness of God kept me from taking that promotion. The goodness of, because it would have moved me across the country and it would have taken me away from the community that God's placed me in that is bringing about the diversity, the unity that's found in diversity of the community I'm in and the full growth and development maturity in the spirit, that's what it would have removed me from. So the goodness of God kept me right here in with this group of people and with the spirit of God because a 10,000-year future is more important than a 30-year future because of the souls and the lives that are at stake that are in our path, that are in the, 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 the area and the place that God's called you to be in each and every day, those lives around you, including your own, there's more value in those souls for the sake of the kingdom than there is for whatever the five-year, 10-year, 20-year, because it, it, it really gets crazy when we think of it in that, in that perspective when we look at you know, 50 years versus 10,000. That's hard to, to fully swallow. Let me move along here. I think I'm actually going long. I don't know. Um, I don't even know when I started. Actually, no, this is a good, um, a good point to kind of wrap this up. So all of this to say, you know, really that's that, that line that, that I shared just a minute ago, I really feel like sums it up up really well is that is the, the discontentment says I need rather than I receive. And so getting ourselves to a place where we understand that all that God has, has put in our lives and given us in our lives, whether it seems like a lot or whether it seems like a little, it was it's with purpose and it's with intent. And 
finding that contentment, I, I'll, I read this scripture a couple of weeks ago, and I'm going to go back to it um, again, because I think that's the biggest question when we talk about contentment and we talk about um, the, the, the um, be, God being enough for us. There are some people who, who will talk about, like, well, you don't understand my circumstances. Like, you don't understand what I'm in or what the pressure I'm under or the life that God's given me or, or this current season of life. And so you might be right, and I don't, and it may be overwhelming. And I agree with that, that you need Christ near you as much as anyone or more. But I, I do want to show you someone who maybe um, who, who you can maybe relate to within the Scriptures, and that's Paul. In Philippians 4, uh, starting in verse 10, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord. At last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned... The secret of being content in, in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And then here's the classic, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Paul was in prison when he was writing this to the Philippians. So when our circumstances seem heavy and our struggles seem too much, we can look here and, and, and God's word always has something for us. We can see Paul finding contentment despite facing impending death or the unknown. He didn't know what, the, what it held for him exactly, but he knew to be content, whether to have plenty or to, have, to be in want. So this morning, really my prayer... Um, My prayer for us all is that we we posture ourselves to a place of receiving all that God has for us right now and living in this uh, place of gratitude, that we're thankful for the uh, we're thankful for the provision. I like to use the word provision a lot more than I do blessing because of the interpretation there. But provision means providing for the needs that I have. It may not be excess. It may not be the, the American dream, which is at odds with the kingdom of God and its pursuits. But it is provision. It's everything that I need God has provided. So to live out... Um, Godliness and contentment is to say, I know that all that I have right now, all that you've given me is from you, and I'm thankful for it. You're a gracious and loving God and have provided for all of my needs, and that's where I find contentment. It's whether I have none or whether I have a lot, it's the same heart in that place. Let's bow our heads really quick. Father God, this morning, I pray that this word would uh, come alive in our hearts and in our spirits, and that we would begin to uh, see you in a new way and see your provisions in a new way and find contentment in you and in you alone, God. We know that want and need uh, that we think that we need for our lives, God, we know that you've provided for our every need. So this morning, I would pray that we would begin to see, uh, see, see you in a new way and that we would rejoice in all that you've done for us. We would live in a spirit of, of gratitude and gratefulness. This morning, I pray that if we have a spirit of, of feeling, feeling that way this morning, that God, God's not provided for me, God's not there for me, that you would touch that heart right now, Father, and let them know, I'm here, I'm by your side, I have you in my hands, and there's nothing outside of my control. In Jesus' name we pray.